What do you think would be one of those hardest decisions that you've had to make? I had to look at both these gentlemen in the face. They just lost their children. And I had to tell them that I'm not going to change my vote. What do you think is the reason? Why do you think it's muddier than this than normally? So that's kind of what the race was looking like between the, really the four of us. Then along came this guy named Casey Asgard. My next guest today is uh, Byron Donalds, who is uh, running for the Florida's 19th Congressional District. Byron Donalds described himself as a pro-life, pro-gun, liberty-loving, Trump-supporting black man, as he says in his one of his first campaign ads. So what I first wanted to talk to you today about, Byron, was first of all, how's, how's the campaign going and everything? Uh, the campaign is actually going really well. You know, it's been, to be honest, it's been one of the nastier campaigns Southwest Florida seen probably ever. But, um, you know, we've just tried to stay focused and stay on our positive message. Um, when, when the attacks came in, we just, you know, you just got to deal with it. But we feel good going into Tuesday. We think that uh, we have enough voters in this race who have looked at my message, who have redone their research, and they've decided that I'm the best candidate to represent Southwest Florida. Yeah. So uh, what I, one of the first things I want to talk to you about was what was the driving factor to, that you got into politics? What was your first what, when, what was your first thing you ran for and how did you get in, into politics in general? Oh, man, that's a great question. So this actually goes back to really 2008 uh, when the financial collapse was really coming. Well, let me take a step back when I, you know, in my early, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't care about politics. When I was in college, I didn't care about politics. And in the really my, my 20s going into my 30s, I didn't care about politics. I was mo like most Americans. I was apolitical. Uh, I was more concerned about my kids and my career, um, serving in my church, you know, coaching youth sports, like, you know, watching sports with my friends. Like that was my life. Um, I actually... One of the guys I went to church with, his name was Scott Vale. Scott Vale one day was talking to my wife, Erica, about a group called Toastmasters. Toastmasters, for people who aren't familiar, is um, a public speaking uh, club. And they teach you to go through the elements of public speaking, how to give speeches, um, inflection points, choosing words, not saying ums, even though I know I probably said three. I'm out of practice. Sorry, Toastmasters. But, uh, you know, it's just... You go through, you get rid of uh, loose, uh, wasted words, and you, you're very consistent in your messaging when you're delivering it. Scott was talking to my wife about joining. And so I'm kind of just standing there while they're talking. And I'm in my head, I'm you know, like, you know, I would, I would like to go to Toastmasters. That would be cool. I would, I would want to do it. Um, my wife couldn't do it because there was a conflict with her job. And she couldn't get off to go to the club meetings. But I could. So I went. And so I started giving speeches and learning how to speak in public, which is something that I was never comfortable doing, but I felt it was going to be important just for my development as a financial professional. And so, you know, during that time, being at Toastmasters, the financial collapse in the United States was also beginning. This is late 2007 going into 2008. Uh, what most people don't know is that I have a career in banking and financial services. Um, and also in international insurance. That's that's what I do for a living. That's how I pay my bills. My company at the time, we had a lot of counterparty risk with um, pension plans in Taiwan and in Canada. And so when the financial collapse started, my the owners of my firm came to me and they said, we need you to figure out exactly what's going on and what our risk is with this financial collapse because our clients want to know. So I started doing a bunch of research on... Um, the, the, the collapse of collateralized debt obligations, um, you know, mortgage-backed instruments, which were the high default in residential real estate at the time, and what the implications were going to be. One of the first things politically, <coughs> excuse me, one of the first things politically I ever watched was the um, House Financial Services Committee on C-SPAN. This is back in 2008. And I turned on House Financial Services because it was going to be a big committee hearing on what was going on in the financial crisis. I'm watching it and I'm like, these members of Congress have no idea what they're talking about. They're asking the wrong questions. They had no detailed knowledge of our financial industry, yet they sit on this committee. And I was like dumbfounded. At the same time, I'm in Toastmasters and they always tell you, give speeches about what you're passionate about. So I started becoming more and more passionate about politics because I'm watching politics really for the first time. I don't like what members of Congress are saying. I feel that there's really no real leadership in the country. At the same time, I started reading books 
on political philosophy. So the first book I ever read was a book by the, uh, called The Law by Frederick Bastiat. First book I ever read. The Law, what it talks about is the original purpose of law itself. And it's written by a guy who was a French philosopher in 1850 before the French Revolution. And he talked about how the politicians in France essentially abused the law, abused the original purpose of law to favor their own interests, to favor the interests of their, of their buddies or their donors or whatever the case might be. So I'm reading this book. I'm doing research on the financial collapse. Um, and then it just piqued my interest even more. So then I started reading um, some of the books that the framers of the Constitution read. I read um, John Locke. I read Montesquieu. I read, I started doing research about world history overall. This is like really a span over about a full year. At this point, Barack Obama is now president. He's pushing Obamacare. I'm looking at the economics of Obamacare. <clears throat> I don't agree with them. I'm saying this is, that doesn't work. You can't build a healthcare system around these principles. What's going to happen is you're going to have more dislocation. Costs are going to rise. Health, and pre health premiums are going to rise. Deductibles are going to rise, which is actually what's happened. And so, you know, I'm watching all this stuff happen. I'm reading about political philosophy and I'm in this club called Toastmasters. And so all my speeches are now purely about politics. I was in the international speech competition two years running. I think it was 2009 and in 2010, I was in the international speech competition. I won, I went all the way to the regionals in Florida and I lost to a guy who gave like a, a funny speech or whatever. <laughs> he gave a speech on comedy, I lost. Uh, the judges liked his speech, um, but it's okay. I, then I was in um, an advanced club. This is 2010 now. I'm in an advanced club and I given a sp about a 20 minute speech about the future of the country, what America needs, so on and so forth. A lady in the club recorded it and she sent me the, the speech and I got it in my office. This is maybe, I want to say this is around October of 2010. She sends me the speech. I'm, lo I'm looking at the speech, right? And I was like, man, I was pretty good. I, I can give a speech. Cool. So that at that on that same day, there was an article in the Naples Daily News, and it talked about a Tea Party rally that was coming up at that Saturday. That Saturday, I think it was a Friday or a Saturday, uh, being put on by the Naples Tea Party. Barry Willoughby, who's now passed away, God rest his soul, was the founder of the Naples Tea Party, and I had been to a couple Tea Party rallies earlier that year. And in 2009, um, just because I was watching on the news and they were talking about Tea Party rallies are racist. Like, OK, whatever. So I like, let me go see for myself. You know, let me go out there and go to a rally. People were gracious. They really cared about the Constitution, about federal spending. They didn't want bailouts, um, but they wanted the government to live within its means and live by the United States Constitution. So I had been going to the Tea Party rallies, but just going like I wasn't a part of it. I was going to see it, observe it for myself. Um, I would stand on the roadside next to people, talk to them individually, and just kind of figure out what was what this movement was. Anyway, fast forward, 2010, I get the speech, I send it to Barry Willoughby. So send him an email and say, hey, you know, my name's Byron Donalds, so you don't know me. I just gave this speech about the future of the country. You know, if you ever need somebody to speak, let me know. He calls me back like two hours later, and he goes... You're, is this Byron? I said, yeah. And he goes, I'm Barry Willoughby. I have a bunch of candidates who are speaking at my rally, but I will give you five minutes. I was like, thank you. So I told my wife and I said, hey, I'm going to give a speech at the Naples Tea Party. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to give a speech at the Naples Tea Party. I go there. I get in the back of a flatbed pickup truck in front of the Allison Craig furniture on uh, Pine Ridge and 41. I gave a speech about really about, you know, the future of the country and what, what is necessary and really about, you know, it is important that Republicans turn out to vote because we have to flip the house because of what the Democrats have done under the first two years of Barack Obama. So that speech is still on YouTube. So people sometimes today, they question it like, well, are you a, really a conservative? And I just go to YouTube. I pull the speech up. I send it to them. And I say, look at the speech, and then you, and then if you have any other questions, feel free to ask me. Um, so that's how I got into politics. Um, that's the full length story. Um, from then, 
I just stayed involved. I ran for Congress in 2012, lost, but it was a great experience. I had a lot of people from the Tea Party movement who thought I would make a good candidate to run. So they pushed me to run. Um, I thought I was Mr. Smith. Didn't have any idea what I was doing, but you know, you just learn along the way. Um, so we won Collier County, which shocked everybody because nobody thought I would ever, nobody thought I would ever get 5% of the vote, let alone win a county. So when I had 30% of the vote in Collier County, the entire political establishment was just like, who the heck is this guy? Like, who is this guy? So I won 30% in Collier County. It was a team effort. We had like 400 volunteers. My wife was my campaign manager. Um, we raised about $80,000 total. Pure grassroots campaign in the purest sense of the word. Uh, the problem was in Lee County, which is the larger county, we only had 8% of the vote. So we lost. Um, and, you know, it is what it is. Uh, fast forward uh, four years after that, I stayed involved in local politics. Four years after that, I ran for the state legislature in House District 80, where, where I represent now. I won. It was a two-person race. I, I beat my opponent by 30 points in the primaries. Um, and then I served in the legislature for four years and, and serving in the legislature was a, a great experience. Um, you know, you have to, sometimes you got to make tough choices and, and make hard decisions, uh, but you always have to stand for the constitution. And now I'm running for Congress again in, in 2020. And so it's been, I will tell you, it's, it's been a crazy, not a crazy decade. It's been a wild ride the last 10 years in politics in Southwest Florida, but you know, it all started just because I was looking at our economy collapsing back in 08. And when you really understood the reason why our economy was falling apart is because we have members of Congress who were passing laws and or not passing the appropriate laws. And they were messing with the rules of the road in terms of the, the, what the purpose of law is supposed to be. They were tilting the law to favor one interest or to favor one set of people over others. And the byproduct of that was the, was the, at the time, the greatest recession since the Great Depression. That was the talking points of it. And, and so my political philosophy has always been law has to be consistent and understood by all people. You can't just change it because of the winds or because of the emotions of people. Law has to be consistent no matter what. And the underpinning of all law has to be our constitution. Yeah, it's really a success story, but... Uh, you mentioned also some of those tough decisions that you had to make while in the House of uh, House of Rep for Florida. What, what do you think would be one of those hardest decisions that you've had to make? Oh, man, there? that's easy. The hardest decision I ever made was opposing Republican. Well, it, it was a hard decision, but not a hard decision. So let me, for the listeners, let me preface that. It was um, voting no on Senate Bill 7026, which, which was the school safety bill after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Mm. When the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting happened, we were in the middle of legislative session. So this is Valentine's Day, 2018. We're on the floor, normal day in the house doing house business. I can see from my desk on the floor, the desk of Jared Moskowitz. Jared Moskowitz is a Democrat from Fort Lauderdale. His kids actually go to school across the street from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. His kids are much younger. So they go to school across from MSD. And I could see his desk. I'm happy to just be standing on the floor. Typically on the floor, I'm standing all the time. I don't really sit at my desk. So I can see him from where I am. And I can see he's on the phone. And I'm just looking around the floor. And I see he's on the phone. Then I see his head just drop. And I'm like, uh-oh, what happened? And he just walks off fast. And um, uh, one of his colleagues, she passed away uh, recently. God rest her soul. She was standing with him. And she, and she left as well. 10 minutes later, an announcement comes from the Speaker of the House. He comes on, stops floor business, and tells us all members that there has just been a shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It appeared at the time it was 10 people, 10 people, 10 children have been, 10 children or adults have been killed, many others wounded, the shooter still at large, and they obviously found Nicholas Cruz and he's being prosecuted for his crimes. About a week later, because we're in the middle of legislative session, there is a bill that is being crafted about school safety. What are the things that we're going to put in to ensure that we protect our students while they're in schools? I'm in my office and a friend of mine, Cord Bird from Jacksonville, he serves, Cord and I have sat next to, we basically seatmates, we've sat together on the floor my four years in the legislature. 
And so Cord comes into my office and he goes, Byron, have you heard about the what's going what's going to be added to this bill? And I was like, no, not yet. And I said, what do you know? And he says what they're putting in the bill is our, our risk our enhanced risk protection orders or red flag laws. And they're going to put in uh, provisions that stop people who are the ages of 18 to 21 from buying shotguns and rifles and long guns. And I was like, well, why are they doing that? And so our concern was basically that we were doing that in order to assuage the Democrats, to show the Democrats that we're willing to do something on guns. Um, so Cord and I had a conversation. I said, Cord, okay, let's talk. Let's, I said, I don't agree with the retail provision. I don't agree with raising the age because if you're 18 years old in the state of Florida and you commit a, you commit a crime, you're tried as an adult. But because you're 18 years old, you can't go to Walmart and buy a shotgun. Those two things, the principle is not consistent. The same way is if you're 18 years old in the state of Florida, you can enlist in our military, but you can't go to Walmart and buy a shotgun. That doesn't make any sense. Um, most 18 year olds, most 19 year olds, 20 year olds in our state would never co commit the atrocities that um, the shooter at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas did. They never would. So why would we put something into law that infringes on the Second Amendment rights of people 18, 19 and 20 years old when they never would have done what Nicholas Cruz did? OK, that was my first issue. The second issue on red flag laws is that if with the red flag laws, if your neighbor across the street has a fear of you and calls the police and they say that you are making threatening statements or whatever the case might be under the red flag laws in Florida, the police can come in, search your property, take your guns and then give you a date in court for you to go back and get your property. Well, that is a violation of the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. There's no probable cause for law, law enforcement to take your weapons from you. So when we talked about this in my office, Cord, at the end of it, Cord goes to me, he goes, Byron, where are you on this bill? I said, I'm down. So, so let me, in the legislature, we don't talk about yes and no. We ask, are you up on a bill or are you down on a bill? So if you, if you say to me, you know, Byron, where are you on this bill? And I say, I'm down. That means I'm voting no. So I told Cord, I said, Cord, I'm down. Tell whoever else you need to tell. That's where I am unless those things come out. Cord was in the exact same place. I ran into the Speaker of the House uh, maybe a couple days later, and he was like, Byron, I hear you're down on the bill. And I was like, I am down. He's like, why? And I go through, say what I just told you. He goes, well, Byron, we're going to get rid of gun-free zones. And I was like, Mr. Speaker, we, you know, you and I agree on a lot of things. More often than not, I'm always with you. I can't be with you on this. I said, because for me, it's never okay to trade constitutional principles for any deal you can cut. Because like I said in the, in the first question, the Constitution is the foundation upon which we build all law. We build all of our laws. So you can't trade a piece of your foundation to get something else. That's my principles. Those are my philosophies. Um, so I told him I was no. And the reason why this was the hardest decision. Well, let me, let me one more story on this one. Yeah. The day of the vote, <clears throat> we're on the House floor. At this point, the members in the House, the, me the Republican members in the House who were down on the bill, we were cut out of the process. We were not allowed to make any more comments, try to make the bill better. We were we were done. They basically cut us out and said, you're no, okay, fine. You're not going to have any parts of this. The House Majority Whip at the time, who's actually one of my opponents in this race, because he's not the majority leader, but he was the whip at the time. He comes to my desk and says, hey, the speaker wants to speak to you. Okay. So I go with him and he takes me to a conference room. In the conference room are two of the parents who lost their children at Parkland. So he walks me into this conference room. I don't know that they're in there. So they, we all sit down and I, you know, they introduce themselves and I'm saying, you know, I say, you know, gentlemen, I'm so sorry for your loss. I have a high school student as well. I can only imagine what you're going through. And they're, they're trying to convince me to change my vote. And they're like, we understand your principles on the Second Amendment. We understand where you are. We just have to do something. We're asking for you to please change your vote. We want all Republicans to be on the same page. And we talked for 15 minutes. And I had to look at both these gentlemen in the face. They just lost their children. And I had to tell them that I'm not going to change my vote. And I understand what pain they're going through right now. But when you're writing law, law cannot be... Law cannot respond to emotions because if law is responsive to emotions, then the emotions of some override the will and the rights of others who are either less emotional or not emotional. Law cannot be a respecter of persons. That's why, you know, 
Lady Justice is blindfolded because the law cannot be a respecter of persons. The law cannot be a respecter of situations. The law has to be consistent across the board, no matter what, even when it's painful. And because that's the only way you can build a consistent society where people can rise and fall based upon their own merit and their, their own desires, their own principles. So I, you know, I left that room. I looked at the whip and I said, why didn't you tell me they were in there? And he's like, well, sorry, man, we just, we have to do what we can to try to keep the caucus together on this one. So I went out. Um, and then when it's time to call the vote, typically on the house floor, when it's time to vote, the votes happen fast. So it's like, it's not like in DC where they leave the vote open for like 10 minutes because you have members walking from their office to go vote. And then they go back to their office in the legislature. We're all on the floor voting. So usually the board is open for 30 seconds on this vote. The board was open for five minutes. They left the board open for a while. So if members wanted to change their votes, they could, because it was actually one of the more important votes that's happened in the Florida legislature since the Terry Schiavo uh, case was coming through Florida. Um, I voted no. And I remember I, I'd never really look at my buttons when I vote because it's just green or red. That's, that those are your choices. I remember looking at the buttons and I looked at them and I'm evaluating everything I know. I'm evaluating the meeting I just had with these guys, with these parents. And I look at the buttons and I click the red button and I voted no on the bill. It was the hardest vote I probably will ever take in my life. Because the tragedy was real. The emotion in the Capitol was real. And I, the one thing I think it's important for people to understand is that when you're a member of a legislative, when you're an elected official, you take on everybody's emotion in your community. And the hardest thing to do is to side with law versus emotion. It's easy to go with emotion. Because in the time, people will pat you on the back and be like, you did the right thing. But in the long term, if you side with emotion over the rule of law, what you actually end up doing is eroding our society. Because then laws don't matter. Laws mean, they mean less and less to everybody. I mean, you could look at what's going on with mask mandates. People trying to push mask mandates right now. They are, an, they are an emotional response to a pandemic. There are people who are emotionally concerned about getting COVID-19. Totally understand it. I'll totally understand that. Totally respect their, their concerns and their fears. But what's the purpose of an elected official? The elected official is supposed to look at data and make concrete decisions for the people they represent within the boundaries of the powers invested into them. And the last part of what I said is more important than the first three within the boundaries of the powers invested to them. You cannot have elected officials who decide for themselves that they're going to go and take new powers that are not authorized to them when they were elected. That's what's happening with these mask mandates. Nobody's given local officials the power to tell people what they must put on their face. Nobody's ever given them that power, but they're taking it because they're siding with emotions over the rule of law. So, you know, going back to um, sometimes of being having to having to do the hard thing, that's doing the hard thing. The last thing I'll say on that on that point is in Tallahassee, Tallahassee is run by Republicans. So. It's easy to stand against the Democrats when they push some bill and vote no. That's easy. They're not in charge. They can put a bill up. And we could just either not hear the bill or just vote the bill down. The Democrats bring amendments all the time to Republican bills. We can vote every Democrat amendment down. No problem. That's easy. The hard thing to do is to oppose a Republican bill, especially opposing a leadership bill and still doing the right thing because you know it's wrong, because you know what they're doing is wrong. That's what I've done in the legislature. Yeah. Uh, so one of the other things I wanted to also talk to you about was uh, uh, Casey Asker, who's one of your, I'd say, one of your other uh, main contenders yeah. for Congress. Yeah. Uh, many people, uh, he's probably, I'd say, second second place right now. Or, or yeah, he there? thinks he is. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, why, why do you think that, uh, if you were going to tell someone why you're a better candidate than him or any of the other candidates, uh, what would you tell them? Um, I get this question a lot, actually. The first thing I tell people is, look, is what's the political background of the people running? Um, I got started in the Tea Party movement. I have a career in finance and economics. I didn't come into politics because my family was Republicans. Um, I wasn't born and bred for this. 
I really came to conservatism out of my own study, out of self-study. Um, I'm a political convert, actually. You know, I was a registered Democrat, but I was really apolitical. I found conservatism. And also, I'm a political unicorn. I mean, I'm a unicorn. I'm different. Um, there's not many black Republicans, frankly. And then, even less than that, there's not many black Republicans who are from Brooklyn, New York. So my perspectives and my philosophies and my view of life is different than even a lot of black Republicans. Because, you know, I would probably say you have a good portion of black Republicans who grew up in Republican families. I didn't. Um, so I would probably say that's probably that's the biggest differentiator between me and my opponents is is really how I came to politics and then what my overall background is, is as a human being. The second thing is, is that um, I'm a proven conservative. Like, you know, we just talked about the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas vote in the legislature. I've had to take hard stances to stand for the Constitution, even when it meant standing against my own party. Nobody else in this race has done that. Nobody. Um, Casey Asgard, Dr. Fig have never taken a vote. They can say how they're going to vote. And they can say who they are in their commercials and when they talk to people, but they've never had to go through the fire. I have. Um, Dane Eagle, who is was the majority whip and what I was talking about, about taking me into a conference room, we've served together. Dane sided with the leadership. I didn't. So when it came time to actually stand for the Constitution, he had a choice to make. I had a choice to make. We made different choices. And so that's really for the voters to decide. The third part is, is, you know, Southwest Florida is one of the more conservative areas in the country. I think that the area wants a proven conservative. I think if you look at my record versus my opponents, I'm the proven conservative in this race. The last thing I would say is, is that right now in America, there is a political culture war going on in America. Our members of Congress have to be able to do more than just go push the green button or the red button. They have to be able to be a leader in the forefront of the conservative movement, because it's one thing to have people like Larry Elder or a, or a, or a Candace Owens who are political activists talking about issues. It's another thing to have a member of Congress who has the stature of being an elected representative who's now at the forefront of these of these political battles that we face. This other part is, is that as a as a party, as a Republican party, yeah, we have to expand our party. And no doubt about that. While at the same time, having to take our message and our principles to all voters. So you have to have people who can relate, who can communicate, who have a set of principles, and frankly, who are unyielding on those principles. And in this race, without question, I'm that candidate. And I just hope that the voters of Southwest Florida see that as well. Yeah. Like you said earlier, that this whole uh, race is a lot more uh, muddier than any of the past past mm -hmm. races. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the reason? Why do you think it's muddier than this than normally? Oh, no, it's more muddy because Casey Asgard went completely negative for about a month. Um, what, here, what people don't understand about this race is a couple things. First, <clears throat> when this race started... The people who were who thought we were going to be, be able to put forth real campaigns were uh, Dane Eagle, Randy Henderson, myself, and Dr. Fig. Dr. Fig's claim to fame was that he was telling people he was going to spend whatever it took to win. Three to five million dollars is what he was saying. So three to three million dollars in a congressional race is a ton of money. Like that's a it's it almost becomes an avalanche of advers of advertising and mail pieces to build name ID so that when voters go to their ballot. They're just like, oh, well, this is the only name that I've ever seen because you've literally just done the tidal wave of advertising, drowning out your opponents. Uh, Dane was going to be able to raise money, man, maybe around a million, million two or so. I thought I was going to be able to raise around seven, eight hundred thousand, maybe get close to a million. Randy Henderson has some money himself. He, you know, word was he was going to put in about a million dollars of his own money at the time. So that's kind of what the race was looking like between the, really the four of us. Then along came this guy named Casey Asgar. Casey Asgar, well, actually, before that, there was a guy named Ford O'Connell who was running. But Ford O'Connell couldn't raise the money, and really, he doesn't live here. And so he couldn't get the political support. So he dropped out, and his entire political team went to a guy named Casey Asgar. Casey Asgar jumped in in late March. So Casey gave himself $3 million, and then he went and raised another half a million dollars. And then he had a political committee that was outside Honesty America. They, you see their stuff on Facebook and you hear them on the radio and they've done mail pieces. They are, are his political action committee. And they had maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars in that, all told. 
So Casey Asgar and Dr. Fig were now the, the self-funders who were literally trying to buy the election because they could run more ads than any other candidate just because they had a stockpile of money to start with. So it was about May, I want to say. Casey Asgar and Dr. Fig just start running TV ads. And they're running TV ads every single week. So the other candidates, like myself, we're sitting here like, they're starting in May? How are we going to compete with this? Like, this is this is crazy. Um, and it's COVID. So you really can't be out in campaign. Uh, all meetings are shut down. You can't even build a real grassroots campaign because everybody's in shelter in place orders, basically. So I told my team, I was like, look, here's what we're going to do. We have to just start advertising as or at the earliest point possible. So let's just keep, we just got to keep raising money, even in a terrible time to raise money because the economy was really, is really struggling and we got to do whatever we can to try to compete. So we started doing TV ads the last week of June. And I said, and that's when we came up with the, uh, I even, I forget the phrase now. Um, gun owning, liberty loving, pro life. You know, yeah. that that's that's the that was the thing. And we were like, okay, we gotta find a way to just break through Casey Asgar and Dr. Fig. And that's the ad we chose to use to break through. Seems like it worked that that little bit worked pretty it well. It did work. And I'm gonna tell you <laughs> it did work. And I'm gonna tell you how much it worked. So we're running that ad for two weeks, right? Uh, about two weeks. We're running that ad for two weeks, and we also got some 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 support which was critical, which I believe is critical to our success, um, which I'm going to talk to in about a moment. We start running that ad for two weeks. And then a poll comes out. And the poll shows that there's a two-way race between myself and Casey Asgar. Casey Asgar was at 30% in the polls. And I had come from, we were hearing eight, seven, eight percent in the polls to 26% in the polls in two weeks. Casey Asgar had been on the TV for about a month and a half at this point. In two weeks, we catch them. Now, let me take a step back. There's an outside group that supports me. It's called the Club for Growth. The Club for Growth has been around for about 20 years. They support conservatives running for Congress. They always support conservatives. They do a detailed, in-depth review of every viable candidate. And they look at their voting history. If they have them, they look at their backgrounds. They look at public statements. They look at anything they can find to make a determination if they're going to actually use their political resources to support a candidate in a super PAC capacity, the club for growth looked at Casey Asgard, Dr. Fig, Dane Eagle, Randy Henderson, myself. Um, I'm not sure who else they interviewed uh, because you know, the other people in the race just, they just don't have the resources to be viable. They're good people, but they just don't have the resources. And so the club for growth decided to endorse me and back me. So here's the backdrop. This is why this is important. The Club for Growth, when they support a candidate, they come in and support a candidate. They don't, don't say, hey, we back you. Go figure out the rest of your race. They do commit real dollars to the campaign. So, <clears throat> like, again, now, now I'm going to go back. This is why, this, why I said that was, is important. We've been running our TV ad two weeks, right? Paying as much as we can to it. Put as much money as we can into it while understanding we have, because this is like, the last week of June, understanding we have to get another six, seven weeks to election day, right? The Club for Growth starts running an ad too about me. And this is uh, Donald, Donald uh, Byron Donalds supports our police. He's going to stand on the side of law and order. And here's what the president of the, of the United States says about him. And the clip the president of the United States says is, I want to thank Representative Donalds. He's somebody with a tremendous future. So that ad's running from the Club for Growth. My ad, personally, the liberty-loving, pro-life, politically correct, is running. <laughs> yeah. We take off in polling. Casey Asgar's political team looks at the polling, because they've been polling, too. And they, make it, they made the decision that made this race nasty. Their decision was, if we don't attack Byron Donalds, we're going to lose. Because he's building too much momentum too fast. And if this thing goes any longer, we're not going to be able to stop his momentum. So Casey takes all his positive ads off the air. See, remember, people might forget he was running this ad about I'm Casey Asgar. My family left persecution from Iraq. I joined the Marines. I built a career. I'm going to fight for you. That's his ad. Yeah. They yeah. pulled that ad off and they went negative on me. 100%. All their ads were negative ads on me. All their mail was negative ads on me. Honesty America, the super PAC, all their digital ads and all their mail ads were ads about me. 
So they started calling me Lion Byron. They talked about the fact that I was arrested when I was young. They talked about the fact um, that um, I was a never Trumper, things that are ridiculous. And so their entire strategy was we have to destroy Byron. If we destroy Byron and get him out of the race, what can come back and win? So this is going on for like three weeks now. So that's why I said the negativity started there. Because if you commit all your political resources to attacking another opponent, now your race is negative. They weren't running positive ads at all for like three weeks. Didn't happen. Well, maybe a month. I lose track. All told now, um, I think Casey and his outside group have spent about $1.5 million attacking me, give or take, about $1.5 million. Um, and then when that's, but here's what happened as a result. When that started happening, there was another super PAC that supports Dane Eagle that came out and started attacking me and, and uh, Dr. Fig. And I was like, oh, look at this. This is cute. Now they're attacking me too. Um, when I was being attacked so much by Casey Asgar, then the Club for Growth, who's my outside committee that supports me, I have no control over them. Federal law, you can't coordinate. So you can't talk to them and be like, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. You are not allowed to do that. You can't, you, you can't have conversations. But the Club for Growth is watching the race, obviously. And they're polling. So they look at this and they say, well, Casey Asgar is going to attack us. We're going to have to attack him. And so they call, they run the ad, Romney Republican ad on Casey Asgar. And then that goes into heavy rotation. I think they were spending, from what I saw, 200, 300,000 a week running that ad. Maybe 200,000 a week, I think, running that ad. And then the mail war start. So then all the mail starts dropping. A lot of mail. And so what, what I, the point I make, I make is that what started this race being negative is that Casey Asgar and his team realized that if they just stayed positive on him and I stayed positive on me, they could not win. They would lose. And once they, that, once they understood that, the decision was made to attack me. Once they attacked me, I mean, what are, what are my outside groups supposed to do? They respond in kind. And then when that starts happening, other political committees are looking at this and they say, well, shoot, if they're attacking each other, now we have an opportunity to attack other people and push our candidate through. So that's what happened. So internally, polling now, my numbers were around 26%. They dropped to around 21, 22. Casey Asker was at 30. His dropped to 13. Like he, his campaign completely imploded, right? Dane Eagle, who was polling around 9%, came up because the people who were voting for Casey Asgar are not voting for him anymore. But they didn't move their votes to me because they're seeing the negative attacks. So they move their votes to Dane. So Dane comes up. So then as Dane comes up, then the other committees are looking around like, oh, shoot, how, where did Dane Eagle come from? Now we got to attack Dane Eagle. Because no, you can't just come up. You have a record too. So then the attacks go on Dane Eagle. And Dane Eagle Super PAC is attacking me and Dr. Fig. And so it just turned the race into this mess. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, the, the point I hate about it is as a campaign myself, we'd made a decision, the decision to stay positive. You know, Byron Donalds for Congress has not run negative ads on anybody. We've decided to stay focused on us. That's when we came out with a second ad, which starts with. When I was in college, I was arrested through the grace of God. I escaped the streets. That is very true. Those are the facts. We ran that ad because we wanted to address the negativity, but also still show people that that was me, but this is who I am now. Here's what I'm about. And that's why we ran that ad. And it's actually been very effective. We think it stabilized us and I believe it's going to help us win. Um, but, you know, when, when somebody launches attacks, what then happens is candidates and or political committees supporting a candidate then have to respond. The thing I think that hurt Casey more than anything else is that he was attacking in his own name. You know, he was literally launching attacks, approving every message. But, you know, he's spending his money. He's spending his own money. So, I mean, if I thought I was going to lose $3 million, I would be upset too. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if I lose, if I think I'm going to lose $30, I'm upset, let alone $3 million. So, you know, I think you, I think he made a decision to go negative. I don't think it's going to work. He's been in fourth place for a while now. Um, I don't think he's going to win. Who is your second place opponent then? That has changed. It used to be Dane Eagle. I think now it's probably Dr. Fig. Uh, we've been in first place for a couple of weeks now. And I think we're going to basically hold on. This last week has just been 
Oh my gosh. This last week, Casey, I think, is spending about half a million dollars, six, six um, half a yeah, half a million, uh, six hundred thousand in negative ads. He's attacking me now. He's saying I supported Obama. That's ridiculous. Um, especially if you listen to the first question in this podcast, you just know how ridiculous that is. Yeah. And um, now he's attacking Dr. Fig and me and Dane. Like, he's attacking everybody. And I think the reason why he's doing that is because they know they're in fourth place, so they have to pull everybody back. You see what I'm saying? It's like crabs in a barrel almost. It's because he's at the bottom, he's got to pull everybody down to hopefully come up. And I think that's his strategy. Um, but it's going to be a close race. I will tell everybody that uh, we think we're still in the we're, we believe we're in the best position to win the race. Um, but it's going to be tight. It's going to be down to what voters think. Yeah. <clears throat> you touched on some, you touched on something that I also wanted to uh, talk about, which was uh, when you were younger in New York. You uh, had uh, you were arrested for drug possession. Mm. Uh, I wanted to know uh, basically, not necessarily touch on the whole story about that, but how has that event influenced your policy decisions in cr- uh, criminal policies, mm-hmm. uh, policies on drugs, and everything and everything in that uh, arena? Well, I mean, to be factual, it, it happened when I was in college. I was in Tallahassee, Florida. I was in college. I was oh, okay. young. I was dumb. You know, I did a lot of stupid things, a lot of bad decisions. And I think that, you know, the biggest thing people don't really understand about decision making is you don't wake up one day and make terrible decisions. It's actually a process of poor decisions that kind of gets you to a place where you look up one day and you say to yourself, how did I get here? And I think, you know, any any adult that's been through life that's hit bottom in life, you it, 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 it happens the same way every time. You typically don't just make one decision and your life is imploding. It's a series of bad decisions. You know, so college, 18, 19, 20 years old, those were tough times for me. Made a lot of poor decisions. Um, so when that happened, I had to first look myself in the mirror, right? And say, okay, how am I going to build myself and build myself back? I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I don't want this for my life. So I decide, okay, now here's what I'm going to do to build myself out. I got to replace friends. I got to change my environment, who I'm spending time with. I have to um, start being more focused on my studies in college because I'm still in college, right? Still enrolled, got to finish school. Whatever I got to do, I got to finish and finish strong. And then I got to figure out how, how I'm going to build my life. How that, imp- how that impacts criminal justice policy is, is that my story makes me believe, not really my just my story, but it helps with the redemption of the human being. You know, I think that all people have the power for redemption. You know, I believe that you are not, people are not the worst decision in their lives. That is not who a person is. Who a person is, is their response to the worst decisions in their lives. That really determines the measure of a man or a woman. The the ability to rebuild yourself is what builds true character. Um, in politics, it's easy to be like, oh, you're terrible because you did this. Okay. Well, yeah, great. Who among us is the person we were at our lowest moment? Not many people. I think in crim justice, the thing we want to look at is first of all, there's just three main principles that guide my thoughts. Number one, if I'm afraid of you, we must incarcerate you. If I'm afraid for my life, if I'm afraid for my property from you, we must incarcerate you. There must be stiff penalties and you must pay them. There are more people that we're just mad at than we're afraid of. If I'm mad at you, you have to pay the price. You might get incarcerated too. You might go to prison. You might stay in county jail. I'm mad at you. You did something wrong. But at the same time, you're still a citizen of the United States. There has to be a way for you to come back and be a citizen of the United States again, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a citizen of the United States. I'd made wrong decisions. There were people who were mad at me for the decisions that I made. At that point, when I was 19 and 20 years old, does that now mean that the rest of my life is is just to be a, a second class citizen in the United States? Because I made decisions, poor decisions, bad decisions when I was 18 and 20 years old. No, I think that all people have the ability to be redeemed, be redeemed. Now it's on them to be redeemed. You have to put in the necessary work to rebuild your life. 
in criminal justice policy, what we should be doing is making sure that people have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. I think where we've, I believe that, again, you have, if you do the crime, you got to do the time. You have to pay the price. But once the price is paid, you have to be, we have to allow you to be a citizen again. We have to allow you to be able to come back. And that's what guides my thinking in criminal justice. Yeah. Yeah. There, uh, I was, I was reading a book the other day. It was about, uh, like, you know, you know, the three strikes laws that are in yeah. California. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on that necessarily where it's like someone could, uh, commit theft mm. and then, or, but then jaywalk the next day mm. or whatever. And that, that counts as mm. like, and then you get like 30 years or whatever it is. But what do you, what do you think about the three strikes laws in California? Well, I think three strikes policy has to be for stuff, you know, that is a uh, violent crime. I think three strike laws, that should be the boundary is in violent crime. Yeah. Listen, let's, let's, let's be clear. I believe in the redemption <laughs> of the human spirit, but if you've committed three violent crimes, I mean, you're telling me who you are. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like let's, let's also not be soft on crime either. If something happens in your life and you do something wrong, you as an individual have a responsibility to make amends for it. And then you have a decision to make. Is that going to be the guiding principles of your life or not? Most people don't want it to be the guiding principles of their life. They see they did wrong and they're like, I got to clean this up. Okay. Those people, the people who see it and be like, I got to clean this up. We got to do what we can to help them. We can't do it for them. Mind you, we just have to make sure the apparatuses are in place so that if they choose to take advantage of that and rebuild their life. They can go do that. Can, yeah. But now if you're doing violent crimes, I, there's nothing I can say for you. So be it. At that point, you've had three opportunities to get it right. Mm -hmm. Three. You know, I mean, the old adage is old, the old adage is clear. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times. <laughs> Fool me three times. I mean, what are we doing? Like, you know, I listen. I think that everybody has to take responsibility for their own actions. Everybody does. I'm a compassionate individual. I believe in redemption. I've seen people be redeemed, not just myself. I've seen people get into a spot and redeem themselves. But I've also seen people who get into a bad spot, say they're going to redeem themselves, wind up in a bad spot again, say they're going to redeem themselves, wind up in a bad... At that point, I got to distance myself from you. Yeah. Because you're not learning. Your, your character... Your actions are saying far more than your words could ever say. I don't want to hear what you say. I, listen, I got three sons, okay? My sons tell me, oh, dad, I'm sorry. I'm, and I tell them all the time, I don't want to hear sorry. Do better. Save your sorries. I'm not interested. I'll take sorry the first time. I'll even take sorry the second time. Third time, I don't want to hear sorry from you. All I want to see is your behavior change. Mm -hmm. And then when your behavior changes, then my look on you is going to change. But I don't want to hear it. And so that's my attitude when it comes to three strikes. Yeah. Um, another thing I also wanted to say was uh, necessarily about the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement that, mm. that's going on. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, some, there's, there's some people that are saying defund the police, get rid of the police, and then some people say more police. But overall, the general aspect, I think, of everything surrounding the Black Lives Matter is that we need more like investment in communities and all that and build back these uh these impoverished communities that then lead to crime and right. such so what what do you think about a reason to tackle that do you think it is uh being more police do you think that the government should give subsidies to people to invest in those communities or do you have any thoughts on that in general um i think defunding the police is stupid i'm from brooklyn new york they just took a billion dollars out of their police budget i know what's going to happen there's going to be less officers on the street. There's going to be slower response times, which means criminals are going to create more havoc. We're already seeing it in their crime numbers right now in the yeah. last month since they've done it. You ain't got to be a genius to know what's going to happen. Listen, the, nar the largest part of any police budget is paying police officers without question. So if you defund police budgets or quote unquote, if you reallocate police budgets to other things, that's what the left likes to say to clean it up. You're taking officers off the streets. Mm hmm. Especially in places like New York City, my home, my hometown, Chicago, 
L.A. See, you need police. I don't know. I don't care what you say. You need police. And the people who suffer the most are poor people who grew up like I grew up. Or to use the less vernacular, who suffers the most are young people who look like me. They're the ones that suffer the most because they're in these communities when the response times are slower and longer. They're in these communities when there's police officers not to be found around, when when tragedy strikes, when crime strikes. So who really suffers from that? Now, what I would also say is if there's other support services that need to happen in the city, well, then the cities of these mayors need to look at their budgets and clean up their budgets. There is crap in the New York City budget that's been lingering around from when Ed Koch was mayor. Yes, Ed Koch. Okay. <laughs> Ed Koch was mayor when I was in elementary school. I'm quite sure there's stuff in the state in the city of New York's budget that's there from him. Go in there and reevaluate your budgets, reprioritize your budgets. The other thing I would say is that this is the ultimate reason why I'm a conservative. What we sh- if you're gonna invest, quote unquote, in, in communities, what you should do is actually provide real opportunities to people. The number one way is in education. If you send a if you send a young kid that looks like me into an inner city school where half the time they're having to find out a way to be safe just to learn, as a po- and blocking their parents from the ability to send them to a different school environment where they can have a different outlook on life, and actually in some respects they had a better education because it's a different environment. Who are you really hurting? Yeah. You're not. You're not. Hurt, you're hurting that child. You're hurting that family that wants something better for. Their kid. My mom pulled me out of public school when I was in elementary because she realized they weren't going to be able to give me the best the education she thought I could des- I deserved. She had to pay for it out of her own pocket. My grandmother helped her pay for it out of her pocket so I could get a transformative education. Without them making that sacrifice, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. So as a conservative, what I'm saying is give that same opportunity to the same families who look like me, who live in inner cities, inner city environments like I grew up in. Give them the opportunity to do that. Don't tell them you can only go to school here. Don't tell them that. Let them make that decision for themselves. If they want to go to school there, that's fine. That's their decision. I think when it comes to health care is another big one. We have to actually go in and put in real market reforms in health care. So health care costs come down. So people have more disposable income in their pocket to do the other things in their life that they need that they need, they, they need to do. These are some of the big things that we got to do. Um, the third part is, and this is the one that's somewhat unpopular, especially for people in the Black Lives Matter movement, is that as black people, we got to take responsibility for our actions. Where does most violent crime occur? In urban corridors. Unfortunately, yeah, in black communities. That's not white people doing that. We got to take responsibility for ourselves. We can't then we can't sit there and continuously lead the nation in violent crime in our areas and then wonder why police are always in our areas. Yeah. They're always in our areas because they get called there. Like we got to take responsibility for ourselves as black people. And I'm not trying to say that because I'm like, oh, well, look at him. He lives in Naples now, so he can say what he wants. It doesn't matter where I live. That's the reality. That's the facts because that's how I grew up. And so I think those are the things that, that we have to do. The last part is I don't agree with these groups like Black Lives Matter using these issues in our country to further their political agenda because their political agenda, it goes back to the law with Frederick Bastiat. Their political agenda is to have politicians change the law to favor one interest over another. Two things happen when you do that. Number one, you breed resentment against among citizens. You breed resentment. Even if even for all of the white people in America who believe George Floyd was murdered and want justice. At the same time, they also don't want to see their police forces defunded. They don't want to see that. Yeah. They want justice. They don't want Marxism. You, you know what I'm saying? No, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So this is, this is the thing. And for that matter, forget white people. Even for the black people in America who want justice for George Floyd, they also don't want police forces defunded. They don't want businesses looted. You know why? Because a bunch of those businesses are theirs. Yeah. What was they doing in Atlanta when you had the, people were putting up plywood and spray paint on the plywood? Minority owned business. Please don't loot. When you got to do that, we have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're you're definitely right. Uh, then I, and then I also wanted to ask you. Uh, still got some time here. Yeah. yeah. The um, 
Joe Biden just came out with his uh, uh, VP pick yeah. for president, yeah. and it's Kamala Harris. So a lot of people in the media are uh, saying how this is uh, a historic moment, how you have the first ever black female uh, vi- mm-hmm. vice president nominee. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on that? With is that an important part or of a, a, a vice presidential pick, or what do you think of just the whole about Kamala Harris as a whole? Well, I do think it is historic. It is. Okay. It's historic because, in part, it unwinds the narrative that the left keeps trying to tell us, that our society is systematically racist. If our society was systematically racist, and I'm going to move Barack Obama to the side for a moment, because he won the Democrat nomination. The voters picked him, okay? If America was systematically racist, how is it that an old white politician would pick a black woman to be his running mate? Yeah. In either party, for that matter. So that on a face, that's why I find their arguments to be so ridiculous. And in some respects, the mere fact that she's the vice president nomination demonstrates how ridiculous the left is when they talk about systematic racism. You're sitting across from somebody who represents a house district in Florida that's mostly suburban and rural in Florida. My district is 90 percent white. Newsflash for the people who listen to this. I represent Dixiecrats. Old school Democrats who are conservatives, Dixiecrats. They're in my district. I represent them. I won the Republican primary with 65% of the vote as a black guy. And I didn't hide that I was black. It was on mail. It was on TV. If you ever seen my, my big signs before they got the face, if you ever seen them, my face is on them. People know I'm black. I didn't hide it. Right? So when I hear these arguments about systematic racism, I just roll my eyes like this is ridiculous. That's not true. Now, specifically to who Kamala Harris is and her, her agenda. Kamala Harris, when she ran for president and in the United States Senate, has advocated for the most left-wing policies in the country. I don't support those policies. She supports the Green New Deal. She supports universal health care. She talks around reparations, which again, I don't believe in reparations. Um, she stands for left-wing policy in America. In America, we got to choose. Do we want a progressive, a quote unquote progressive future, which is really a socialist future or a Marxist future? They just put progressive on it. So it sounds cool. Do we want that? Or do we want a future based upon, frankly, what has created the, the, the nation that's the envy of the world? People poor in America are better off than poor in any other country in the world. Yeah. Without question. If it was a question, we wouldn't have poor people trying to immigrate both legally and illegally into our nation. And for that matter, you would see a flight of poor people from the United States. Where else do you want to be? And if you, and all right, so let's let's settle that. You want to be here. What society do you want? Do you want a society based upon merit of the individual? Do you want a society where government is limited and their, their authority is confined? to certain things and no more. So you, the individual are free to make these decisions for yourself. Or do you want a society where elected officials are making these decisions in your life when they don't even know who you are? We, I just met you. You seem like a nice kid, but I don't even know enough to make decisions for you. You need to do that for yourself. My job is to make sure that government does its job, but no more. It doesn't take new powers. It doesn't have that never been granted, frankly, by you and the citizens of the, of the United States. And that the rules to the road are open and fair so that you and your counterparts can make those decisions for yourself, depending on what the decisions you make in your life. Do you make bad ones? Do you make good ones? Did you study? Did you slack off? Did, do you work hard? Are you that person that, that you know, the supervisor is always having to call to make sure where are you You're five minutes late? Like those are decisions you got to make for yourself. Yeah. I can't make those decisions for you. And then how you rise and fall in our economy and in our society is based upon what you do. I, the last thing I'll say is, I, of course, I acknowledge the country's past when it comes to race. I have one of the, when I was young in the elementary school I went to, we had a detailed, very deep education into slavery and segregation and civil rights. I'm well aware of the history of the country, but it's 2020, not 1920. The country has come so so far in such a short amount of time. Do we still have issues? Yeah. Yeah, we still got some issues. We had this knucklehead running around town, 
shouting racist things. He was spray painting my sign and the sign of another another black candidate here in Naples. Do we still got some issues? Yeah. Is that representative of all white people in America? No. Is that representative of the institutions of our government? Not anymore. There was a time where our institutions were systematically racist. That did happen, but it doesn't happen today. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, final thing is, what would you, what would you say to anyone? Uh, what, what do you think the people that we haven't touched? If we haven't touched on anything that you want to uh, viewers or any voters to know about you, uh, what would it be? Hmm. I, mean, I don't know. I said a lot in this thing. <laughs> um, the one thing I would want them to know. I mean, the, the bigger thing I would probably tell the voters is don't watch negative ads. Political campaigns are marketing. Okay, they're all marketing. Yeah. Every candidate is trying to put themselves in the best possible light. And every attack ad is trying to make their, their opponent look like the worst person ever. Okay. Don't pay attention to the marketing. The marketing is designed to just make you aware that we exist. Okay. So for the voters, yes, I'm Byron Donalds. I'm running for Congress. You know, I am a pro-Trump, liberty loving, gun owning. I, I do all that. I am that person. But what I would ask you to do is actually go sit down, take 20 minutes and just research me. Research all the candidates for that matter. That's actually the responsibility of every citizen. Actually take a second to look into who these people actually are. Don't just look at mail pieces and make decisions. Don't just look at TV ads and make decisions. Go to a computer. Everybody's got them now. But I would tell the voters, Google me, YouTube me. I'm there. And there's so many interviews, so many Sit, uh, sit downs I've done like this, speeches I've given in House committees or on the House floor, speeches I've given in the Tea Party movement, speeches I've given at President Trump's rallies. Um, I've written documents um, on my website. I wrote something 10 years or eight years ago called The Vision. It's like six pages, My Vision for America. I wrote one. It's like kind of like my own little manifesto. I keep meaning to dig it out, but I just never get to it. But it's like six pages of what my thoughts are. And I really need to update it because I wrote it eight years ago and I got to look at it again and, yeah. and, and, and do all that kind of stuff. But my point is, is like, just, I ask it if you just do your research, I think you'll realize I'm the best candidate to represent Southwest Florida. But at this, at the end of the day, you, ha every voter has to decide for themselves who's the person they want to represent them. Not what I think, what they think. So I would tell you, sit down and research all the candidates. And then make a decision on who you think would be the best person to represent Southwest Florida. Hmm. All right. Is there anything else that like uh, any of your handles or Twitter, like Twitter, Instagram, that people would want to follow? Oh, they could find you? oh, I'm going to come the handles real quick, but I'm going to add on to the last thing I okay, said. Okay, sure. Get, yeah. I'm going I'm to add on. Yeah. The reason why campaigns get negative and the reason why you have people who come in and spend more and more money is because people don't pay attention and they don't do their research. So if you, if you hate negative ads... Do the research on the candidates. D do it. If you're tired of having bad elected officials, go and take the time to research the people you're voting for. Because if you pay attention to your politics, you won't need the ads. You won't need the ads. Um, Plato said, this is Plato's quote. I didn't make this up. People who don't pay attention to their politics will be ruled by their inferiors. If you don't pay attention, you will be ruled by your inferiors. It is incumbent for everybody to take time and pay attention to politics. And I know some people are like, I don't really like politics. If you may like politics or hate politics, you may love politics or not care about politics, but I promise you politics always cares about you. Yeah. It always does. <laughs> so you need to, you need to get involved. Yeah. Now, uh, handles, um, follow me on Facebook. It's a uh, facebook.com slash Byron Donald's. My Twitter handles at Byron Donalds. Uh, for those of you on Parlor, check Parlor out. I'm on Par I'm on Parlor at Byron Donalds. I'm on uh, Instagram. Everything is at Byron Donalds. Uh, we kept it pretty consistent. My website is ByronDonalds.com. Um, so it's pretty easy to find me. Um, again, when you go and Google me, don't pay attention to the ads. You know the search ads. There's people who put things in search ads. Don't follow that stuff either. That's either propaganda from. Uh, my opponents trying to trash me. So they'll try to throw a headline and look at what Byron says on this. One of them says, see what Byron Donald says on Black Lives Matter and Antifa. So I clicked on it myself and it takes you to some page where they're bringing up all the negative attacks on me. And I'm like, <laughs> really? 
you just you're listening to the podcast. You heard what I think about Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Yeah. Um, so really, just do your research. That's the biggest thing. If, if people do their research, we're going to make sure we get good people elected. All right. Thank you so much for doing this, Byron. And uh, everyone, have a good day. Bye.